Hey everyone, it's RCK again. I have a few things to talk about before we get started on this video. First off, I want to talk about how awesome it is to not only already have 100 views on the first video, but I already have 12 subscribers. I really, really appreciate it, and I can't thank you guys enough. This has been a great experience for me, and I've been having a blast so far. Speaking of which, the other thing I want to talk to you about was the structure of the videos. Since I would like to keep these at a 25 to 30 minute range, I will not be able to talk about or go into detail about pretender creation unless I decide to make a multiplayer, what's the word I'm looking for, the post videos of a multiplayer game that I plan on playing. I will, I will, I will make a separate video if that's the case. I will also try to keep research to a minimum of three research goals. I will also show examples of expansion. I, will, I won't be able to show real late game battles. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to do something like that since there's so many, so many different things that could happen. It's hard to say, oh, well, this is going to be your plan, but you know, you, you might be fighting another nation at a time. You know, there's so many different things that could happen. And lastly, I like to talk about a strategy which I would believe to be used in either the early, mid, to late game. Now, other than that, I would like to go ahead and get started. This national overview is going to be on an early age nation called Calum Eagle Kings. Now, for the units, um, well, actually I don't want to go over units at first. I want to go over your cap sites and go ahead and get that over with. So let's go ahead and look at the first cap site. You, cap site you'll have here is the Palace of Eagle Kings. Now you'll be able to recruit a few of your mages, some temple guard, but the big deal about this is you'll get three air gems a turn and one water gem a turn. Now to go ahead and start, the really big thing about playing Kalem is you're going to be starving for air gems the whole game. You're going to want as many as you can. It might even be worth site searching or for it early. Um, let's go on to the next one, which is going to be the Spirehorn Mountain. And you can get the Kavi Archer, and you'll get one air gem per turn from this. And then lastly, you're going to have Raven's Veil. You're going to be a few more warriors, and you're going to be able to get one earth gem a turn. So in total, you're going to have four earth or four air gems, one earth gem, and one water gem from just your capital. So let's go ahead and start off on these units here. So first we're going to have the Raptilian, Raptilian, Raptilian <laughs> Militia. So it's going to have 8 gold, 4 research. Four research. It's going to be a very cheap, cheap unit. Um, was, all they have is flying. They have a weak spear attack since they only have 10 strength. It's, a, it's an okay unit, but it's not something you're going to be using a lot of in the game. I found that the only time I ever recruited any of these two militias here, either a Spirehorn or Raptilian, that the Spirehorn is going to be much better because not only will they have shock resistance, they'll also have cold resistance and a magical weapon. So that's going to be a really big deal for only an 8 gold price, where the other one I believe was also 8 gold, which is right. So that that's, I mean, I don't know what point you would ever want the Raptilian over the Spirehorn. But the only time I ever ended up making the Spire Horn was when I had five resources left, and that was the only thing that I could make at the time. Um, let's go on to our next unit here. We have the Area Light Infantry. Now, Kalem has a cool, pretty cool mechanic. Now, a few other cold nations will have this too, where they have ice protection. Now this means for every cold climate that they're going to be in, they're going to get one extra protection since it's just ice, ice protection one. So say if this light infantry was in a cold three climate, he's going to be sitting at 11 protection instead of eight. Not only will he have that, but he will have a magical weapon. Um, most of Caleb's units will have built-in magical weapons, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, they're very, very useful. Um, they also have 15 cold resistance, with just a very low price of 10 gold. Um, they also have a shield, but if you notice, they don't have a helmet. 
that can come in. That can be a pretty big deal sometimes when you're fighting heavy archer armies. Um, after that, we're going to be looking at the area infantry. Excuse me for a minute as I take a sip of water here. All right. So again, we're looking at a 10 gold unit. I believe it's around double the amount of resources, surprisingly. But with this unit, you are coming with not only ice studded armor, a shield, and you'll have an ice cap. And now this unit will still have ice protection 1, so you won't be looking at a protection skill of 11 if you're in a cold 3 province. You'll be looking at a, pro or a protection skill of 14, which is going to be a little bit nicer. But if you notice, now this unit here, the infantry, is not going to be holding a spear, so he won't have that minus 20% against armor that pierce damage normally has. He's going to have a 25% damage increase after he gets that first initial attack through. It has its situations. Um, I would prefer spears at all times just because most things you're going to be fighting will have pretty decent protection. I mean, you're in an early age. 14 is going to get through most things, but you want to have something just in case. So let's go on to our next unit. We have the Raptorian Warrior. Um, it looks like it's just an upgrade from the Raptorian Militia. Um, a little bit more gold. I believe it costs two, two more gold, um, more resources, more than double resources, I believe. I believe the resources on a militia was five. Um, you won't have any cold resistance. Might be a big deal. But his short sword will also have slash and pierce, which is going to be pretty interesting. And he also comes with a helmet. So if you needed him, he would be useful against archers. He still wouldn't be the one I choose or chose for that. Um, next, we're going to have the Spirehorn Archer. Now, I'm going to group all three of the archers together because not only will you have the Spirehorn Archer, which will have shock, cold, flying, and storm immunity, which means he's able to fly during the storm, which would otherwise prohibit anything that doesn't have storm immunity to not do that. Um... Also, I believe that just because this unit has storm immunity, that the storm will still stop around 50% of the arrows that are shot, even if he does have storm immunity. So that's pretty interesting that you would ever want to really use any of these units. But at the same time, you know, it's working against you. And I'll show you, go ahead and show you the other archers. So you have the Blizzard Warrior here. Um, Going to have a Frostbow dealing magical damage. I believe it's fatigue damage. Yep, fatigue damage here. So that, that could actually come in handy if you ever needed it. does have storm immunity and does have ice protection. A little bit more cost on the gold here. Not too bad on the resources. Um, no shield. Well, of course, an archer wouldn't have a shield, but no uh, no helmet. Um, and lastly, for the archers, we have the Kavi archer. Which these are actually kind of interesting because they have storm power, which is something we haven't seen yet. Now, storm power is going to increase, I believe, it's strength, attack skill, defense skill, whenever you in a, you're in a storm, so it's actually going to put you up to 11. He's going to deal more damage with his bow, um, his attack skill. If he does come in combat, he's going to be a little bit better attacking. He's going to be a little bit harder to hit. Um, so does have storm immunity, so he can still fly. And it is a sacred unit, but as I found with Kalem, it's not that you really want to take a bless on. I always thought that you're going more of a scales build, which that's what I've done so far. And it, it's been working out as far as that goes. Because honestly, I mean, you have magic weapons on all your units anyway. There's not really anything that you, you can't really take a strong bless with these guys. I just don't see it. I just think they're much better as a scales nation. And like I said, recruiting any archers, I mean... There might be various scenarios where you might actually need them, but at the same time, it's also working against what you're trying to do. And I always found that with you doing your thing, you might as well do your thing the best you can instead of trying to stop somebody else from doing their thing. Because if you're able to do yours faster and they can do theirs, you're probably going to win. Um so we went over Spirehorn Archer, so we're going to go next to Spirehorn Warrior. 
So this unit's going to have, it's only going to cost 10 gold, pretty low resources only being 7 since it is, does have low protection. Recruitment of 9. So you're going to be able to make a large amount of these troops. They're going to have shock resistance, cold resistance, and storm immunity, not to mention flying. They will have an ice lance, so a magical damage lance with a pierce damage. Um, they're not going to have a helmet. That's that's one of their downsides. Um, other than that, they're really good units. They're they're going to be a unit that yeah, if you're you're going to don't don't plan on low attrition. Um, you, you're probably going to lose a lot of these guys just because of how low their protection is. Um, that actually brings me to this other warrior here. Which is basically almost the same thing. Has the same attack, um, same damage, same type of damage. Um, shock, storm immunity, gold resistance, but they'll have a bronze cap. <clears throat> they are going to cost five more gold, so they do have a 50% increase in gold cost, and not only that. They're going to have a 33% increase in your upkeep cost. The upkeep cost of the Spirehorn Warrior is going to be 8. I don't think I showed that to you yet, but that's what it is. Um, really, really high recruitment point cost. You're not going to be able to make these as fast. They're going to cost more. And their only really big difference is they have 11 protection versus 6. And the only reason for that is because they're going to be wearing a bronze cap. Now, honestly... Since protection really isn't that big of a deal since it's so low on these guys, I would never recommend building Tempest Warriors over the Spirehorn Warriors. So I, I believe that the Spirehorn Warriors are going to be your core army. You're gonna, they're going to be the most warriors that you have overall. Now, if you do decide to make some of these guys be my guest, it's really no big deal. There's not much in between them, especially if you're going scales. That money cost really isn't going to make it's not really going to put as much of a dent onto you, per se, but it is, it is what it is. I want to let you guys know that. Um, the next one I want to talk about here was the Ironclad, or Iceclad. Now, this one's going to have actually have ice protection, too. So that means in Cold 3, he's going to be pushed up 6 protection, going to 19. Now, I do believe these guys have, their, have a certain place in your armies if you decided to go that way. I feel like they're going to be more of your defensive force if you decided to make one. They do have high resources and high recruitment points. But I don't really see you guys being very aggressive in, with these troops since you don't actually know. Except, say uh, Everyone in the game isn't going to be a cold three nation. So you really can't rely on that because you know, there's no telling who your neighbor is or even what kind of skills they even took, regardless of what nation they're playing. Because taking these guys into a Heat 3 province, I mean, it's not going to be fun. The whole point of you using these extra resources and extra recruitment points, it's going to negate the fact that you have ice protection. Um, so there's really no use for them other than the defensive style. If you, Maybe you got rushed or... Maybe you're doing some anti-raiding, so someone's raiding you and you're just trying to take land back. These would be very useful units to use against them. But other than that, that's the only use I see for them in the army. Next, we have these Temple Guard. Um, fun, uh, I thought they were kind of interesting. The whole Their background to them is they cut their wings off so they couldn't run away. Now, they are going to have ice protection. They are sacred units. They have bodyguards. Ice protection 2, that's going to knock them up to 19 protection as well. Cold resistance 15. High resource, high recruitment points. Um, I really don't see, it's kind of the same with these guys and the archers. They're kind of working against what you want to do because all of Calum's troops, high mobility since they're able to fly, lots of map movement, um, very... What's the word I'm looking for? Like alpha strikes. And you're going to be moving with a map move of 12. You're going to be moving one spot a turn. If you're lucky, two, two squares, two locations a turn. I highly doubt it, though. So mostly it's just going to be one. Um, they're just kind of working against what you're planning on doing. 
Now, other than that, I really don't have nothing much to say about them. I don't think there's a bless that would be particularly good on them. So we can go ahead and go to the next unit here. Now, this is going to be your main sacred. Well, I wouldn't say main sacred. You don't actually have a main sacred unit, but you do have three sacreds, being the archer, the foot soldier, the temple guard, and the Maria warrior. Now, the only unique thing and the only thing I really ever plan on making these troops for is because they're stealthy, they're sacred, and they have flying. Now, the pillager doesn't matter as much, but you can do it if you want to. Um, they're going to have a light lance, so decent. It actually, it's going to be higher than your average troop dealing 15 damage. They're going to be double the cost of your Spirehorn Warriors, and not I think it's about two to three more resources actually i'm not really quite sure on that one but a lot more recruitment points here. i think you can make three spirehorn warriors for this amount um you do have a shield bronze cap and a ring mail but that's only going to bring you to 11 protection but the only real thing about these is really going in the deep strikes since they are stealthy units you can go ahead and put them far back into the enemy's lines and once you decide to attack you can really start taking a lot of territory and surprise them because if you notice your spire horns and your other tempest warriors no other troops that you have will have stealthy and so far we've noticed it's going to bring us to our last unit here which is going to be the mammoth now i know people can do elephant well i'm just saying elephant but it's mammoth expansion and it's it's okay i've seen it done I've never done it myself because I, I see that there is a very high, what's the word? It can go really poorly. Um, these are very expensive units, make 125 gold apiece. Now you can make 12 spire horns for every one of these guys. Um, look, kind of low morale. It, it, I would want more morale if I was these guys, but they're notoriously known for running. This low, low magical resistance here means they're not going to be your late game troops. Um, as much as you want them to be, they're, they're just not. For elephants, as far as elephants go, actually having 13 protection is going to be pretty decent. Um, you have a, thir or a 21 fierce damage tusk attack, which is really no big deal. Because you're going to be dealing most of your damage through trample. Now it's going to be, tra be trampling... Everything below size six, so five down, it's going to be able to trample. Um, that's really all I have to say about them. And just like how I explained the temple guard, since these units aren't able to fly, I really don't feel like they have any place in your armies. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go on to our commanders here. To start off, you have the Calian Cal Cal Scout. Um, now, the resistances and stuff on a scout really don't matter. It's going to be up to your average scout cost. But the only good thing about the scout, I believe it does have a little bit more stealthy than a indie scout you would recruit. Actually, I didn't know they had ice protection and storm immunity. I never caught that part. But having a flying stealthy scout is going to be really nice. You're going to be able to know a lot of what's going on on a battlefield. And you're going to be able to not only do that, but in the early game, really get information very quickly due to how fast your scouts can move and how many provinces they can fly over you're going to be more than likely you're going to know who your neighbors are to begin with before they do you're going to know who their neighbors are maybe even before they do um depending on how you like the scout um so really really nice scout here i do believe um it's worth spending castle recruitment turns recruitment point turns and building these guys early on just to get really good scouting information later on in the game. Um, next, we're going to be going over your first commander here. With having 80 leadership, that's going to be really nice. Um, 75 gold, eh, about average here. Ice blade, not really important. Uh, you really don't plan on ever thugging these guys out. They're just going to be your high leadership commanders. Um <clears throat> A nice thing, they do have storm immunity, cold resistance, and shock resistance. Um, shock resistance 8, actually. Okay, I didn't notice that before. But if you notice, whenever using shock magic, 
or air magic has to do with shock. You actually are going to need really, really high shock. Um, like to say the spell th th Thunder Strike. Now that's going to hit a square, probably deal 20 to 30 shock damage. And then all the squares around it are going to be dealt area damage. Now having eight shock resistance, now that might actually resist against it. But if you're in the square where the, where the thunder actually struck, you're going to probably die even if you have eight resistance. Um, that's going to bring us to our first mage, actually. Now, we have the Spirehorn Seraph. Now, they're going to be a 45 gold mage. Um, so, you're going to have really, really cheap research monkeys for only 45 gold for 7 research, which that's going to be very nice because in my builds, I always planned on going Magic 3 being a scales nation. So you're going to be paying 45 gold for 10 research. Now that's, that's going to be really, really hard to beat. Um, not only that, actually, let me look at their upkeep real fast. 36 gold a year. Not too bad. You're looking at about 3 gold a turn. Which that's going to bring, actually, I think that's going to be the cheapest mage out of the rest of your lineup here. After that, we're going to have the Aria Seraphines, I believe. So these are actually very interesting mages. Now, during expansion, these are the mages that I'm going to send out with my armies. You do have to be very careful with these guys, though, because if you notice, they actually have zero protection. So any stray arrow might actually just take them out in one hit, which I've had that happen a couple of times already. But it's just something you have to be careful about. Another really interesting thing about these guys, they're going to be your only fire access. Not only that, they're going to be holy twos that are stealthy. Which are actually 65, they're even more stealthy than your scouts are. And they're also sacred. That doesn't really matter as much. But the thing about this is that you're going to be able to put still or you're gonna be able to sneak these troops into your enemy's territory that you plan on attacking and start to preach now hopefully you're going to be able to start turning the dominion over around the edges or maybe even farther in if you really condense these guys down into a province and what when it comes time for your alpha strike hopefully most of your most of the provinces are going to start to either turn cold or you're going to be able to preach it down so hopefully it's not going to be heat three because you are going to be a cold three nation and that's really going to hurt your fatigue when every battle that you have not only that if you notice these guys are 110 gold and our last mages were only 45 and they have the same amount of research not only that these guys are sacred so they have half of their set or half of their upkeep costs and the other mages are still even cheaper than that so i wouldn't recommend making these guys to be your research monkeys um they're definitely good to have but i wouldn't make them in mass next we're going to be going to this unit right here the harab seraph so these are actually really really interesting mages that i enjoy in Kalem. Is because this is going to be your death access later on in the game. Um, really, really good possible paths here. Any path you get here is going to be very useful to you. So any air randoms, you're going to be able to do anything between summon or say if you're in have a storm going, summon storm power to cast elementals, cast thunder strikes. Um, any Earth 1 mages you can use as thugs. You can also use them for sight searching. Any Death 2 mages, you can give them a skull staff, and all of a sudden they can cast Wailing Winds or Horde of Skeletons. Um, really, really good mages. I do recommend you recruiting a couple of these guys just to start getting those path, path access. Um, if you notice when your cap sites, you actually don't have any death access from your cap. So you want to make sure you go ahead, try your best to get a death two, 
and start searching because I know I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but some of your late game spells that are your national spells, they're going to require death. So it's pretty interesting. All right, next we're going to go to the area, area Seraph. So 125 gold, um, 11 research, 100 gold a turn. Um, these guys are going to be your Thunderstrike and... I would also say Storm Elementals, if that's what you decided to go for. Or Air, air Elementals, sorry about that. Um, you do have a little bit of water access here. Um, overall, I think they're a pretty good, pretty good mage. Um, not too much to really talk about them, though. Next, you're going to have your Sacred Commander. Um, they're okay, they're okay. Now, you could either use these guys, but I wouldn't recommend it in your stealthy stealth parties. I would still probably recommend these uh, area seraphines because they're able to bless the sacred units that you will take along with you. So if you do have any bit of a bless, I do recommend that because these guys will not be able to bless them. So that's going to take us to our main mage. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say main mage, but actually I would. I would say that. These are your eagle kings, and they're going to be the best mages you can make. Um, they have really, really high path. Um, you have a slight chance to go into another level. Now, these are going to be really nice. I didn't know you could actually get fire on this. I thought it was just these three right here. But any, any, actually any of the path you get would be really, really nice. Fire, not as much, but Earth 2, you're going to be able to make boosters. You're going to be able to go into Earth 3 and then maybe even Earth 4, depending. Um, now with the Water 2, you can make a booster and you go up to Water 3. Um, Air 5, not as big of a deal, but it is nice to have. Um. You'll be able to cast larger spells a lot easier. Now I do know this is a very, very expensive mage, and it's going to be slow to recruit. It's going to take you two turns to recruit him, but you're definitely going to want him. Um, unfortunately, he is only a holy two. It would be really nice if he was a holy three, but he would obviously cost a lot more. Um, let's look at the cost upkeep a year. So, of course, it's going to be really, really high upkeep. Other than that, he is sacred. He has all three, which is actually really nice. Shock resistance, 17. Cold resistance, 5. He's a magical being, so you do have to be mindful that he is magical. Um, just because some people may have answers or extra things that might deal with magical beings. And he does have storm immunity. So now that we've got all that done... We're going to head over to the game, and we're going to look at some research goals. Let's go to research. So what I'm heading to here, I, I believe this is going to be almost, I wouldn't say almost, but very seldomly would you ever want anything but Conjuration 5 first. Because summoning full-size air elementals are going to be a very, very big deal for you. Since you're going to be able to summon so many of them, it's really going to be able to turn the tide of any battle that you have. And normally enough, like I spoke about this earlier, you can't really have a small amount of shock resistance for it to really matter you really you really need almost like 30 shock resistance for it to really become for you so you can't really notice it at all so this is going to be a really really big spell for you especially early on people's not going to be able to answer this as much now other than this i, I think this is the main spell here in conjuration 5 i mean you have a few other things um not really anything I would recommend as much, but just just really summon air elemental. That's a really big deal here in Conjuration 5, which is why I'm saying it's going to be your first research goal. Next, um, 
I'm going to be looking at evocation. So we're going to go all the way down to level 6. And the reason why I chose level 6 is because you're going to be getting two other spells on the way there. So what's at level 6? Not only are you going to have Wailing Winds, which is going to be a really, really great fatigue, not fatigue, morale um, play in any battle that you have. It's going to be really, really nice, and some people will mo more than likely not even see this coming. Um, other than that, you do have Wrathful Skies. Um, 15 AN shock damage, Storm doubles the number of lightning strikes. I don't know the cert, uh, particular number on how many lightning strikes you get, but I know it's going to be a lot, especially if you have the spell Storm Up, which is here at level 5. This is one of the spells I spoke about you getting through Evocation 6. Now, if you remember, most of your units have Storm Immunity, and this is a spell that they're talking about. So it reduces precision by half, 50% of the missiles are lost, and storms also incurs the effects of the spell of rain, making it harder for fire mages to cast their spells. But also that also makes so units are not able to fly unless they have storm immunity. So it's going to be a really big deal for you. But don't forget, you can't be cast in caves, so make sure you know where you're going to be fighting at. And the other spell that we're going to be looking at here is Thunderstrike. This is going to be a very, very nice spell for you, especially during Storm, since all your low mages can do Summon Storm Power, which is in Conjuration, very low, and then able to cast these Thunderstrikes. Now, they're going to deal a lot and lot of damage, because very, very few units are going to have Shock Resistance 26, while also this is the area of effect I'm talking about here. It's also going to stun, stun units, which is that's going to be really, really handy when they're in the middle of fighting. Um, those are the only things I had to talk about for your second research goal. Excuse me for a minute as I take a drink of water here. Something I was really surprised about when making YouTube videos was how dry your throat gets for talking so much but that's that's getting off track here let's go ahead and go to the third research goal which is going to be here in alteration now i'm going to go all the way down to actually i just want to make a quick look at this you you do have some early not that one you do have some early maybe thug spells you can cast might be decent enough to Maybe take a Providence, thug something out. Maybe one that has any of your Earth Mages. As you get Earth Randoms, it might be nice to thug with. But you want to go all the way down to Alteration 7 if you can. And go for Fog Warriors. Now this is only an Air 5 spell, so it's going to be really easy for your Eagle Kings to cast. So what this spell does, it says any damage is reduced to 1. Maximum 25 points of reduction. A hit that would be dealt 25 plus in damage or a hit from any magical source cancels the mist form after the damage reduction. There's also 1% chance that enchantment will expire after protecting against an attack. So what this is going to do, as long as it doesn't hit over 25 damage, it's only going to deal 1 damage whenever someone hits you. Not only that, it's going to make it even harder if they don't have magical weapons. So it's going to really, really give a buff to all of your really cheap flying chaff, which is going to be really, really nice. That's why I, that's going to be the third research goal here. Um, that, I believe that's going to wrap up research. So those are the three main goals I wanted to talk about. So as this turn in the game, I wanted to simulate a couple expansion battles. And we'll go ahead and go here. Now this is, like I said earlier, I usually planned on going a scales build. So this is just, say, one turn worth of recruitment, one, one area of Seraphon. And I wanted to actually show this, because this is actually a very costly battle here. Yes, you do have a lot of units. But I also <laughs> forgot about a very, very critical 
spot to really think about when you're doing these battles and it, I'm sure you guys will be able to pick it out as soon as I, we viewed a battle here. I didn't want to remake it because people do make mistakes and this is the biggest mistake that you can have with something like this. Not only is that but you're going to be playing against armies that will have archers here so that's going to be a very big deal because this is a zero protection unit that I put out front that they're going to target first. And I also don't think his Sermon of Courage is not going to hit any of the units that we have. Maybe it might target them since they have a higher HP pool around here. But he also may target himself first. Let's go ahead and see. Okay, he actually did target them. I'm surprised. And if anyone didn't know, Sermon of Courage just gives... Actually, that's just Friendly Dominion. Hold on. Let's see if it did target him. Huh. I don't know. Maybe it hit them. Yeah, it did hit them. Okay, they, it did. He did reach off and hit the uh, hit the troops. I just had to find the right ones. So they're on hold and attack rear. I put them in the very far corner of the map. Now this unit is supposed to be sitting somewhere back here with them, but as you can tell, I made a mistake. So I want to go ahead and back up here because they're about to fly off. Now these units are on attack rear. So they're going to be coming back here, yep. And as soon as they attack, they're going to have that first strike damage against that priest. And I was hoping that the commander stayed around the priest, but it doesn't look like they did. So hopefully we'll be able to take them out fast and route the army since those are the only commanders left. And luckily enough, there are actually three, so it's going to be rather difficult for this small amount of troops. Um, we have that guy there, no big deal. I'm still fighting, still fighting. What I believe happened... From us taking so many losses, we didn't route them as fast as we wanted to. They came back here. They started attacking our units. By the time we did get around to killing the commander, which we just did, they actually still have morale. Did we not kill him? Maybe we did. Maybe they just haven't broke yet. But regardless, with these flying units here, all the units that are going to be retreating, these guys are going to be getting in their path, forcing them to fight. So even if they have low morale or lower skilled even though they're routing we still have to fight them and it looks like they are starting the route now yep and you see they do take a drop four minus four to routing so pretty interesting if you guys didn't already know that and there we go the rest of them's running away and it looks like all we have left here is our mage surprisingly enough so let's go ahead and go to the next battle. So this, I know it looks like it's a little bit more, but this is actually the combination of the first group that you get, turning the one commander into your profit, and one turn's worth of recruitment. And I did make sure I go after a harder province with this one because it is stronger. And I will talk about my scripting for this battle. So the large group of the Spire, Spirehorn Warriors in the back, square formation. I will also have the Prophet right here. He's going to be casting Divine Blessing and then cast spells. They're also, they're also going to be on hold and attack rear. Now all the archers you get from the very first turn, I just put them in line formation and set them to fire. They're going to walk up. And they're going to start firing at these units here. These war, these archers that you get in the beginning are also very useful in taking heavy cav provinces because the heavy cav are going to smash into them, break their lances, and at the end of the day, you really don't care because you don't care about any of these archer units. Now, while this is go here is going on, I'm sure at this point, and actually we caught it just in time, these troops are coming down on their commanders here these mages. Um, I don't know if any are coming down this one right now, but looks like they all went for that first one, but they might go for that one next since they're on attack rear. So at this point, interesting how a warrior is up there, but that's whatever. I mean, they're dealing with the archers, not really that big of a deal. One got dropped there, taking out the other commander here. So I believe at this point, these units are going to start to rout and let's see yep 
and I believe all of them are routing at this point. So that's all going. That's going to be all she wrote for this one. Even though these are going to be, these are definitely harder Indies to fight. I was definitely concerned about this battle, but at the same time, I knew we brought enough having that first round of recruitment with us. So we do end up winning. Like I said, losing these 14 archers isn't that big of a deal. Losing seven Spirehorn Warriors kind of sucks, but this group or expansion party still has room to expand. You can still pick provinces out. Um, another good thing about Kalem in the early game is that you're going to easily be able to pick out, okay, I can easily take this province. I can go take this one, this army. I can go take this one, this army. You aren't restricted by only moving one province a turn. In this last battle here, this was just one turn recruitment with a area of Seraphon in just 10 PD for Mark Verney. That was just a random nation I had it set to. Um, I mean, I was playing as that nation. I just made sure I set it to 10 PD because I just wanted to show you how well you can raid. And I had a very, very simple setup. This is how the first battle should have went. One of the area seraphons here in the middle, casting Sermon of Courage. In a box formation set of Spirehorn Warriors. And we'll go ahead and watch how this battle plays out. Now this is just against 10 PD here. I'll go ahead and scroll in. Oops, wrong way. So the units have already came down. They've already taken out the commander that was back here. Um, that's really all I have to say about it. I mean, they're still fighting at this point, but they don't have much longer. They're already starting to lose their morale. They are in hostile dominion, too. I forgot that does give a different morale base to it. And at this point... They have all broken. Attack seal 3, defense kill 2. Um, they're not going to be doing much well against us. Um, they can still deal damage to us just because of how low our um, protection is. So we still plan on taking cash fleets because of that. But overall, that was a very, very decent, I wouldn't say decent, it's a very efficient raiding party. Very cheap. Um, well, how much gold did we lose, actually? Let's, let's look at that again. Lost 60 gold. Providence worth 72. So overall, we made money that turn, actually, from raiding. So that's going to really conclude everything for this national overview. Um, I hope every I hope I really hope to see everyone back here next week. I do plan on um, uploading another national overview for a nation next Friday. I haven't been able to get my microphone yet. The I wanted to wait till I got the refund for my other one before I actually spent the money to buy another get another one just in case. So still waiting on that. I don't plan on posting any multiplayer videos yet until I get a nice new microphone. So keep your, keep your eyes out for the next video. I had a lot of fun doing it. Can't wait to look, can't wait and see your comments. So have a great day guys.